COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we now teach our students. You know, learning new technology systems, communicating with frustrated parents and confused students. There's lesson planning, there's canceled or rescheduled recitals, there's exams to worry about. Everything has changed. But there's one thing that has not changed. And that is our passion as music teachers to provide the best possible learning experience for our students. And today you will learn the four components of a successful online teaching experience. We're gonna learn four tips to teach online successfully with my very dear friend, Suzanne Greer. And I am so excited she's here today. I'm Glory St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory. And I too have been deeply affected in changing the way that I teach online and communicating with my students. So as I said, my very special guest today is Suzanne Greer, Ultimate Music Theory certified teacher, uh, NCTM piano teacher and performer, who's about to share those four tips to teach successfully. So welcome, Suzanne. Hi, Glory. It's great to be live with you today. I'm coming at you from Min Minnetonka, Minnesota, coming at you live and I'm wow. uh, really happy to be here. It's so much fun. And, you know, it's interesting, Suzanne, because just before we, we went on live with everyone, we sort of said, oh, you know, we got this all set up right. And, and you know, I do a lot of interviews, so I'm used to doing the Facebook Lives. But what is interesting is that now with teaching everything online, everything has changed. And I want to do a formal introduction because you are quite an incredible lady. So Suzanne Greer, she currently serves on the faculty of the McPhail Center for Music, and she teaches both Suzuki and traditional piano lessons. Now, Suzanne uh, received the performance degrees from St. Olaf College and University of Minnesota, as well as the certificate in piano pedagogy from the University of St. Thomas, and Suzanne is an Ultimate Music Theory certified teacher. So tell us a little bit, you know, you've done a lot of things. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got started. And I want to give a little shout out to our viewers today that we're here talking about, you know, the, the things that are going to make your online lessons work. So go ahead and ask questions and we'll make sure to jump on them as we're going through our interview today. So take us back, Suzanne, <laughs> you know, what got you on your path? Yes, um, it's quite an amazing story, really. Um, my mom was a violinist, and she introduced music to my world very early on. So I was a Suzuki violinist to start and went through the Suzuki program, uh, took piano, and she brought me to a concert when I was about six years old. And I remember it vividly. Absolutely. I remember the the performer walking on the stage and I being mesmerized. And when I saw the person performing live, concert grand on the stage in this very small town, I grew up in a small town of Duluth, I was completely mesmerized. And I said at that moment, this is what I am going to do with my life. Wow. And since then I have followed that passion. I was fortunate enough to get an excellent, excellent teacher at, in the sixth grade, and her name is Marianne Swallow. And she took me from not being able to read, not being able to count, <laughs> and uh, took me from where I was at, because I had had a previous, my previously the teacher that I had was kind of the neighborhood teacher, and she taught me a great love of music, but not really all the fundamentals, and so I was lacking. Um, Marianne Swallum took me there, taught me interpretation, tone, beauty of tone, the, introduced me to the great music. By seventh grade, I was playing concertos and um, giving recitals, full recitals by 10th, 11th grade, and I followed in her footsteps, and. And I, and I just want to mention that um, she just passed away on March 10th recently after many years struggling with illnesses. But I feel driven, determined, and it's my mission now to pass on and to continue her legacy. So this is a very transformational time for me. Yeah. And 
the reason why I think we must continue teaching online during this time because it was music that transformed my own life. And I have the ability and the power to perhaps introduce music in a way that could transform somebody else's life. And I want to continue to pass on that legacy. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a beautiful story that you're sharing, Suzanne, because when we think about your almost transformation at the age of six, and I think it's so important for us to expose our young students. You know, I've taken my students as a group, we've gone to the symphony, you know, and that, and maybe they would never go except that, you know, the teacher organized it and we're going as a group and it's going to be fun. And then we're going to go for, you know, coffee or lunch after whatever these opportunities and i think sometimes we think well we teach piano and they're just taking it for fun but you just never know when you're going to have that little suzanne as you <laughs> and transform her life and i think now more than ever we're just really saying okay well how can we still do that and i think there is um there's a lot to learn with getting started you know teaching online and and so things are different and i've done several youtube videos on how to teach online using zoom so you can check it out on our youtube channel ultimate music theory on youtube but once you're all set up with the tech side there is the actual teaching online that really needs to be addressed and i think once you're set up you know, it, now we kind of wonder the next step. So today um, you're going to share with us the four components of um, successful online teaching experience. So I want to jump right in and start with component number one. And, and you, uh, you know, sent me some notes here and said, this is environment. So can you elaborate a little, Suzanne, on, on what do you mean by environment? Well, if anyone is familiar with Suzuki, uh, the Suzuki approach, the environment is a critical piece of what we do and that we train the parents to provide a nurturing, welcoming environment. So I want to discuss two aspects of the environment in our online setting. Number one is our own personal environment, our studio, our virtual studio, if you will. And, and then, of course, the student environment in their own home. And we have such a unique opportunity right now to go into the homes of our students to see what their setup is and to manipulate and guide the parent. And, and this can be, this doesn't have to be Suzuki, this is in your traditional lessons as well. Right. So I'm gonna start off with, the, with my, in my own personal environment and what I've done. Um, number one, laptop, of course, and, uh, and you can go visit Glory for all of these, how we set up these things, but I've got two webcams. I have one where I can quickly, in Zoom, I can just switch between them. And again, we're not gonna get into that today. Um, but the other piece of the environment is I have a big poster right behind me and and I put it right in front of, when I'm teaching, I put it right in front and it says, make music every lesson, because I need to keep that at the forefront of my mind and smile. Yes. I mean, these are these, because they're just seeing like right now, that's all they're seeing sometimes. Um, and then of course you, you're gonna want angles of you at the piano, um, but to utilize that and, I mean, it's easy to let your face drop and you just want to always smile. Just keep that smile going because you can be that positive, bright light in your student's home where they're going to look forward to that lesson every week. And they're going to want to continue when this whole thing is over. Right. Yeah. So um, the other thing I like is just to have little props around. So, um, for example, I have I've got Freddie the Frog here. <laughs> um, I've got my whale. Okay, so this worked great. Oh, I have also, um, okay, so if they, if they keep playing, then I just put my, oh, wait, there we go, my stop sign. Now, these are, I'm not super creative now, so you can get much more creative with this. Um, okay, so when they do something really well, we go, fantastic, yay. Okay, and then we have smiley faces. I have my ladybug, so I can help them get their ladybug hands. And of course, Sola. And Tito. Yay. <laughs> so I have all these little props that I use. And then I've got my whiteboard. And and then in, and sometimes I'm 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 kind of more hands-on. So I'll use the whiteboard also. So you can use that in your environment, in your virtual environment. Yeah. And then you can also get virtual stickers. I haven't done that yet. I'm just 
I'm old school. Um, so then another thing, then moving on to the student environment, here is where the money is for me because I can see where the piano is. Yeah. And of course, we all get to learn how out of tune some of our students are. <laughs> Absolutely. And then we're pleasantly surprised when I find that my student has a Steinway B in their home. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> but um, I think helping the parents. So I've been sending out tutorials on how the parents should get their uh, technique technology set up, you know, how they should set their laptop up, how they can in Zoom, they can set up the settings for better sound on the, on the, for the piano. And we're not going to touch on that today, but I'm sure Glory has lots of inf information for you about that in other um, Zoom videos and, and webinars. But at any rate, what I have found is people don't read their emails. Yeah. Okay, so I send out these wonderful, I spend hours on emails sending out how to set up I just take the first five minutes of the lesson and yeah. I don't go through it. Yeah. And then every week, what I've now we've done this four weeks, mm -hmm. and I have found that every week they get better. Mm -hmm. And I become a better teacher every week because I am giving specific, clear instructions on how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting that it's done. Yeah. I think a lot of I, and this is what I learned from my teacher, Marianne Swallow. She had extremely high expectations of me. Yeah. And and, and it was important to me. I mean, I look back at my diaries and I would write, I didn't practice enough this week. <laughs> I need to practice more next week. That's my goal. Well, <laughs> um, I think I one of the things too that you just mentioned, you said, you know, you get a sneak peek inside um, the environment. And one thing that that one teacher shared with me uh, just in, in the Ultimate Music Theory Facebook group, and she said, what was interesting for her is that, you know, we talk a lot about, about um, nurturing our, our relationships with our students. And when you see them coming in, you know, very, you know, sort of immediately, you know, they're, they're either frustrated or yeah. confused or they're not ha happy or they feel bad because they didn't practice enough. And your story reminded me of her story. And she said, when she finally got to see her student, who never really practices a lot. This is such a, a, an incredible opportunity for us to take a sneak peek inside our students' homes. Where do you practice? Not only may the piano be out of tune, but maybe they're playing on a keyboard that doesn't have a pedal. Or, you know, at any rate, this particular teacher said her student never really practiced a lot and she never really knew why until now. This student's piano is in an unfinished basement. And for this young child, going into the basement felt kind of scary. And so she didn't really like to go down there. It wasn't that she didn't want to practice, is that she didn't want to go downstairs mm -hmm. in the basement. And so we now get to say, oh, I see, this is why. And even in teaching, when you're when you're now observing your student and they've kind of usually we get them to angle the piano or their their computer screen at the keys right yes as well as so we can see their hands and their face and their book or whatever but what's interesting is if you're observing the background you might see the parents walking back and forth you might see the tv on in the corner you might see you know the dog jumping up and down or barking and you're now oh well, that is distracting. So I think, you know, and we're going to kind of lead more into this as we go through these components. But one important thing, I think, is that in order to have a successful lesson now, more than ever, is an opportunity to really help the student create an environment for successful learning. And by even tweaking a few things and saying, well, maybe you could just get a little divider and put it up there, or maybe you could move the keyboard into, you know, your bedroom or like, who knows what, but I think this really is an opportunity to um, to jump in and, and see your students. I want to share one fun thing that, that I did with my students today because we're talking about environment. So this week it was bring your pet to class day. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> I got to meet, I took some pictures of my students. I'll post them on the Facebook page later. I took pictures of my students and their pets. And I thought it was so much fun. And those that didn't have pets, you know, would some of my students have their own Solentito. So they would either like hold up their little Solentito stuffies or they would have a stuffed animal or Freddy the Frog, but some little thing that they love. So it was kind of a cool opportunity to, to take a little peek inside, you know. Um, awesome. Have you experienced that too? 
Yes, yes. I haven't done the meet your pet, um, but I have met a lot of pets. I like that idea. And actually, for my next group class in May, I am doing for the kids. We're, I, we've decided we're doing a pajama party, a pajama recital party. And they're very excited about that. I think the other thing I, um, that I want to mention, too, is for our young, our very young students, it's, it's real important that they're seated at the right height and they're not too close. So I've been just really helping the parent um, get them set up. You know, if they're sitting too low, then we're going to we're going to go find something, a cushion or books or something to get them propped up because we want to make sure that they're practicing in that same environment that we're teaching them like in the normal world in our studio. But now I think it's I think we have just this really a wonderful golden opportunity to, like you said, get the sneak peek into their homes and really set them up for a very positive and structured environment that that they'll continue. I think after this this is over. That's the key, and I think honestly, I think the not only is the practicing going to improve, but the students will now have a better understanding as to how to practice and all the things that they need within their environment. So I think this is really interesting. And one of the things that uh, you know we talked a little bit about is you know what's the you know the quality of the piano. Well, we're not going to tell them to go buy a new piano. We may ask them to have their piano tuned. <laughs> But I think one of the things that we often struggle with when we teach online is sound, because, yes. of course, music is sound. And um, and now more of our time we're really teaching. And, and most of the time when we're teaching, it's about creating the sound to reflect the mood of the music. So we have to accept what we cannot change. And, and I think it's important to accept that, you know, when I, I hear, you know, people saying, well, the sound quality is terrible. I'm like, well, I know that, but my student is playing, making music yes. so for, for a minute. I mean, of course you always try to improve that, but for a minute, let's just be accepting and it's just still early in the game. Right. So yes. we want to make sure. So that brings us to component number two, scheduling. <laughs> So let's talk about scheduling practice time. How does that work, Suzanne? Uh, scheduling practice time. Well, you know, I think, I don't know about you, but right now I've got students going gangbusters. They are not involved in sports. Right. They, their sports are put on hold for a little while. Uh, you know, I think they can do some, some of their other activities such as chess. I, I had a student that was doing some chess online <laughs> and, <laughs> and they can do some other things, but this is piano season. I mean, right. we are, we are in it. Yes. I have students learning, memorizing pieces within a week and I'm sure that everybody, and that's why I guess right now I'm feeling so driven to yes. just provide the best um, lesson experience and the best practice experience. So as far as scheduling practice, um, there's many different ways. I, I One way that I've learned from other teachers is to send, just have Google Docs for every student, and then you would send that practice sheet right after. Yes. Um, I'm not that organized. <laughs> I just have to admit that I can't do that. So I, I prefer actually for the student. So I had a student last week that came and to her lesson and I had given her her all of her practice. So I think it's up to us to make it very specific. And now we have, I kind of think of this as I'm there, right there practicing with them. And I'm gonna give them step-by-step step, step instructions. For my older students, they're writing that down. And yeah. I am making sure that they're writing it in their notebook. Yeah. So last week I had a student that came to me and said, this is what I did this week. Yeah. I made a list. I made a spreadsheet of everything I'm going to practice. And I have other students that make um, rotation spreadsheets of their technical skills so that every they're rotating on a daily basis, their right. technical skills, getting ready for the RCM exams. Right. And then um, then it, let's talk about younger kids, because now younger kids, we, it, it, we we part of what we can do right now is really focus on student centered teaching. Yeah. But with our younger students, they're really not going to be able to do that. And I'm talking like I teach. I just taught a three and a half year old this morning. Um, and then we can go up to say age six where they're really going to need the parent. So then it's up to the parent. I have a great suggestion that I just got from our McPhail um, parent education specialist. And she suggested we've got to make it simple. We've got to be compassionate to our parents because 
I mean, at first I thought, wow, they, the kids have all this time. They can practice all the time. Yeah. Uh, well, the parent is teaching online. They're teaching homeschool now. Yeah. They are overwhelmed. Some, especially those with the, I think those with the little kids are more overwhelmed than ever. So yeah. we have to be compassionate and kind and accept what they can give us right now. And then again, give them very clear cut, concise instructions. Absolutely. And one suggestion is to take three things because sometimes, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I give them way too many things to do. So <laughs> the, parent, the parent takes three things. They, they themselves make a card. So they make a card, whatever those three things are, and they can draw pictures on that card. And then, or maybe they make six cards and then they pick three of those when they're practice time and then they set them out and they put maybe a little Lego at the end or some right. kind of um, reward at, and we'll get to rewards later, but some yeah. kind of reward at the end. So we want to keep it simple and yeah. manageable for those little kids. Now the older kids can be much, I think they can take on much more and we can expect a lot more of them because they're, they, they, a lot of the kids are telling me they're getting done with online school the first half of the day and then Absolutely. they have the rest of the, half of the day to practice. Yes. And I think when you talk about scheduling too, and you're being so helpful with these suggestions, I often tell my students, you know, I want you to practice for one hour. Send me a text when you start, send me a text when you're done. Now for me, I only have 10 students because, you know, obviously I run the business, but um, so for them, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. They go, hi, Miss Glory, you know, I'm starting now and I go, woohoo, you know, and so any method of communicating so that we are helping them and motivating them. And like you said, you can give them a little, you know, virtual sticker on a, on a text message or something, but getting the scheduling in place. And I think consistency is, is the big thing because sometimes, you know, like anything else, um, when you start something, you're super excited. And yep. then after a while, the momentum is gone. So setting them up for success is all right. So you're going to do your, your, you know, your school or whatever you're working on online. And then you're going to, you know, have lunch. And then at one o'clock is going to be practice time. And it might even be more effective because it's not after school and after going to basketball and everything else, got a little more energy, get it done earlier in the day. Right. Yes. I think that would be yes. helpful for them. Um, yeah. One of the things that you shared with me was, and I think this is a really big one, and I'm excited to hear you to share this. And that's component number three, which is language. Now, <laughs> I know you're not talking about, you know, English or French or anything, <laughs> like that, but what exactly do you mean by language? <laughs> well, I already alluded to this a little bit, but being clear, concise, a lot of times and slow, um, a lot of times when we're in this format, this online format, words get lost. Yes. So I have to slow my speech down a little bit. And when I speak, I need to be very specific. So for example, at, let's say I'm with an older 10 year older, um, older student, yeah. I am going to specify, I would like you to start at bar one and go to bar four. Right. And you have to be, and maybe some of, some of us maybe already teach that way. Um, but if we're used to maybe not being that as specific as that, we, we really need to, yeah. that's, that's one piece of the language. And then I just want to, I want to stop you there because I actually want to put an exclamation mark at the end of what you just said. That's brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant, and I'm speaking from experience here, is that when I was doing my first online lesson with my student, which I now do what you just said, but I didn't then. So now they're playing because normally when my student plays like that, and if I want them to stop, I just go, okay, right? But I'm they can't see me. Right. So when I'm like, wait, stop. Now you're like, stop. Now you're trying to overpower the piano yeah. to get them to stop. So. I really like that one. So thank you for that. If the specific instructions start here, stop here, then you can discuss, right? Right. Perfect. And they'll get used to it. You know, they'll get used to that. At yeah. first they might, I mean, some of my students, they will continue going, yeah. but after a while they start, you know, but then if you sit back, the other thing I've learned is silence works really well. Um, if you don't say anything, they stop talking or they stop playing. Yes. <laughs> so so um, the, the lack of language, really. Um, and in, in my Suzuki teaching, we try to, 
demonstrate more and speak less. And I think this format really allows for that. Exactly. And, and this and the kids, especially the little kids, I mean, they love to look at you. I I had a I was teaching yesterday and I had a, a six year old who every time I demonstrated, she jumped off the piano and and ran it every time I demonstrated. And then she'd run back and try it. And so I mean so we can so I guess their demonstration rather than speaking yes. often will be much more effective yes. way of communicating. And especially in this kind of format, I'm finding I'm demonstrating a lot more. Um, and then let's see, as far as I'm doing, I've kind of been studying this whole language thing. And um, so one thing I just from a, a, um, yoga and uh, meditation is just very simple instructions. So I'll do one that I really like that it's just tall back, open chest. So instead of sit up straight or yeah. whatever it is, I mean, sometimes I'll say, let the balloons pull your head up. Um, but I just like these simple instructions, tall back, open chest. And they seem to respond to that. Um, or like I do my ladybug a lot, ladybug hand. Uh -huh. So when I'm rather than I tend to speak, have more words than I need. And so if I can really hone that language down so that it's again, concise, yeah. direct, uh, clear, and yeah. as specific as possible, right. that seems to uh, create much more effective um, communication. Yes. You know, you kind of made me smile when you said, think of the balloons carrying you up. Um, when I was a little girl and I would go for my piano lessons and I used to always have a ponytail, but I always had it like right on top of my head. And my teacher would always say, imagine someone's pulling your ponytail. I know you <laughs> That's you great. Know, always make me sit up taller. And so I still remember that little, little ponytail trick. It's funny that you mentioned the hand too, because I often will take my Sola and just put her this way. <laughs> and use that because it sort of is the perfect little thing and and also it's soft right uh -huh. so it, it doesn't right. feel uncomfortable for them just you know sola sola says you know curve your fingers kind of that's nice great to, to put it there um you know we talked you talked about the language thing and i and i just want to sort of do a little segue for for a minute just into learning styles one of the things um, and, and you know, because you've taken the Ultimate Music Theory Certification course, that one of the things that I really feel strongly mm -hmm. about is really understanding, you know, learning styles and communicating effectively with students. One of the components within the certification course is not only first identifying your own learning style, but then identifying the learning styles of your students. Because if you're teaching um, a visual learner or an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner. Now, all of a sudden, you need to use different languages to to speak with them. And it was really fun when uh, Suzanne did the um, Ultimate Music Theory Certification course. We actually did it as a live event, didn't we? Yes, we did yeah. here in Plymouth, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really fun. It was it was so interesting to see also different learning styles of teachers. You know, oftentimes, even as educators, we tend to teach the way the way that we are in our learning style. So um, maybe tell us a little bit, you know, like what was maybe one of the reasons why you started in the certification course or, or what was your what was your biggest takeaway? Maybe uh, I think I started, I guess, you know, I met you at a MTNA conference and I was just I really I think the materials, the clarity and I saw you give a workshop at an MTNA conference. I, I can't remember which one. It may have been in Chicago, actually, yeah. or New York. It was either Chicago or New York. And I I was so, I loved, I loved how you were so clear and that you had many ways of making it fun, learning theory fun. I think that's the biggest piece of what I've learned from you and, and how to do that. And then the piece that you talked about, the neuro linguistic programming and knowing what our students um knowing their learning style i have a long way to go in that i think i can get a lot better at that yeah. uh, but i think it's so important and um, what i learned in the class that was a big takeaway for me yeah. is being able to identify those learning styles not only myself but also in 
uh, my students. And, and again, like I said, I, I think I can get a lot better at that, but that is, is a really important takeaway for me. Yeah. And I think one of the things too, I'm just going to grab my little, my little sticks here. If I don't miss anything, when we talk about, um, teaching online, um, you know, it's not just, so if you teach piano or violin or whatever you teach, and of course, you know, ultimate music theory is my thing. But one of the things that I wanted to just talk about was to engage them. And you see, I have my little, my little rhythm sticks here, because uh, one of the things that we actually did in the certification course, as I recall, is we talked about communicating through visual um, uh, rhythm and rather than just always through words. And so even with your students, if you want to say, you're asking them a question, right? Mm -hmm. And by taking a couple of sticks, they may be able to do the rhythm and tap it back to you or tap the rhythm that's in their piece or just do something that's, you know, we talked about bring your pet to class day. You talked about having a pajama party recital. Um, it can also be bring your, bring a different instrument to class. So, I mean, obviously I've got my little, my little sticks here because I've got my little um, other xylophone here. Uh, so we've kind of, I'll bring it in so we can kind of, you know, do different things. And we can also play things like you just need to think outside the box. Yes right? Like what can we do that's different that will engage all the components of music theory? And certainly when I'm teaching too, you can maybe see the whiteboard behind me. Um, another thing that I'm doing as well when I'm teaching theory is that I will often take my answer book and because now how are you going to mark all of these pages? Right. Um, you know, there's different components to teaching. It's not just listening, 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 but it's like making sure that you can see the music, but also you need to, you know, we've got theory exams coming up with RCM. So very often I will simply open up my book and say, okay, are these the answers yeah. that you had in your book? And so, yes, I'm showing them the answer book or they'll show me theirs. But I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways to really help those young, you know, ultimate music theory students still feel successful. And um, I remember some of the exercises that, that you were doing, even when we talked about, oh, and this is a good one because when we were doing and it still is part of the certification course online but when we were doing our live event with you we talked about composing ideas and doing things that were different so it's a little challenge to our viewers here to say part of your teaching online can also be as simple as composing a little song so for example i was doing this with my students yesterday and i know you've got your your uh, I do. So what if we take um, our pentascales, I'll just see if I can find my pentascale here, and have students, oh, there we go. So now I have my pentascales. I'm in the beginner C book, I think. So if I'm doing my pentascales for C major, you can see that I have C major and kind of trying to peek to make sure I have it, C major and C minor, and just challenge them to use those five yeah. notes, right? And write just based on C, D, E flat, F, G, or or no E flat, but yeah. something because it's so engaging, isn't it? It is. Yes. Well, and, and getting back to language, you you were mentioning this earlier before we went live, and the language of you were going to have students um, when you ask how they are to use Italian terms, right. which I think is such a fantastic idea. Right. That, that is a really fun idea. And I think yeah, we should elaborate on that. Um, Susan and I were, were chatting and, you know, you brainstorm. That's a great thing about, you know, being in a Facebook group or just connecting with other like-minded teachers. And we just said, okay, well, what can we do that's fun? And, and I said, well, you know, this week your homework is, you know, taking your theory book and writing a story using all of the Italian terms. And then Suzanne said, well, you know, maybe we should just have an Italian lesson. So if I ask you a question, how are you? You have to come up with an Italian term to answer that question. Are you feeling happy? Are you feeling sad? And I think that's hilarious. And I'm going to implement that one. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that little tip, Suzanne. That's a good one. And I guess uh, finally, the final component, number four, 
is reward systems. So what can we do now? Because I'm a sticker queen like you. <laughs> and, you know, we also, I also, whenever my students are doing theory, we always snip the outside. Oh, right, right. But we snip, and then they get, um, uh, they get to go shopping with their snips. I have a little store and they can go shopping for jewelry. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. Yeah. So they get their snips and see how much they they oh, that's great. In, uh, shopping at, at Glory's Jewelry Store. <laughs> yes, I know. Another story for that one. But so, um, so let's talk about the rewards uh, that they can have now. Okay. Well, I think that whatever reward system you're currently doing, you stick with. So for instance, I'm doing, I do this year and I've done in past years, I'm doing the uh, 40 piece. Well, I call it the 40 thing challenge. So I have different um, like they can do five theory pages and they get a check. And then once they get 10 checks and then if they complete and memorize a piece or they do five sight readings yeah. um, in the four star book or something or, or whatever in the, in another lesson book, they do five pages, then they get this check. So when they get 10, they get a different, um, prizes and my prizes are good because I believe that prizes need to be, um, motivational and, and I, I know we go back and forth on, you know, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, but sometimes that extrinsic motivation is, is can really, you know, a spur the student on. So why not? Um, so I, I like to use the, um, the gel pens, but now I can't, of course, give them that. Right. right. So I also, part of my prizes are like a $5 gift card to coffee shop or music store. So I can do that. I can still do that. I can send them a virtual $5 gift card to Starbucks or something. And then also like just, I'm just in the lesson. I've done this a lot. I'll say, let's say we're dealing with, a, excuse me for just a minute, but let's say we're dealing with somebody that's young. So we, I, I, my instructions are to do it three times. Okay. So the first time you get a prize when you do it perfectly. So this is your first prize. This is Mr. Beethoven. So I'm putting <laughs> some theory in there too because I'm introducing them. Oh, and I ask them if they know who it is. And so if I do this, so I say, this is your second prize. So if you play perfectly a second time, then you get another reward. And so then I show them this and I say, who is this? And I've often got George Washington. <laughs> 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 this is Mozart. <laughs> That's hilarious. I know. Okay, and then um, so this is, comes from my other life, but this is the <laughs> prize. This is a prey dog. Oops, from South Dakota. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. So anyway, um, okay, and then you can do the. There also, I haven't done this yet, but you can find virtual stickers. So you could just pop a virtual sticker on right, right in their lesson. And I mean, I think whatever we do. Uh, just kind of it's novelty it's sort of that novelty approach and and it, it can capture their imagination and Absolutely. especially the young children but even the older children too and I showed you earlier just some of my um, I'll put up a smiley face or I'll use like in zoom I'll use the emojis um, the clapping hands or thumbs up or even just sometimes thumbs up you know just yeah. doing it thumbs up you know yeah. um, and I so, think that's, that is really, um, you know, we, we can't give them a little pat on the back or give them a hug or, or a real high five, but it still is important to have that reward system. I've been telling my students just to put a happy face on their their page. And when they come back, I'm going to have puffy stickers. I'm going to have smelly <laughs> stickers. I'm going to have like fuzzy stickers. And so they're just going to be in like sticker heaven because they'll get to put you know, get caught up with all of their stickers. So I had my student and we were using the whiteboards, um, which is kind of behind me here, you can see it. And I said to my student, um, hey, um, what can you do? Oh, Susan is on, she says, I see that. <laughs> thank you for your energy and your time. This is awesome. Okay. Yay. <laughs> I so, oh, Lisa says, I so miss giving stickers. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, that's cute. One of the things that my student did, I this is going to be embarrassing, but what the heck, we're, we're all teachers, we'll get it. So on the on the whiteboard, there's the circle where you can draw the circle of fifths, or you can use it for rhythm division, right? Yep. So I said to my student, um, you know, on your whiteboard, because you got the right answer, go ahead and draw a little happy face. And so I said, okay, show me your happy face. And she was like a little bit reluctant. And she said, I drew you an emoji. 
And I said, okay, so can you show me? So she crosses her fingers like this in front of her eyes. And then she puts her tongue sideways. <laughs> and then I went, what is that? And so then she showed me her whiteboard and she had done like two X's, right? And then the little tongue sticking out the side. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this has just opened up this whole little personality yeah. that I have not yeah. seen before. Right. And, and because maybe they're at home and they and they and it's so fun to be silly because your students will do this. And yeah. you know, honestly, it's hilarious. I think we just have to keep that open mind. I wanted to share, I know we're almost wrapping things up here, but um, I wanted to share um two things. One is just a little something that I'm going to do next week with my students. And I'll tell you how this came about. You know, you and I, Suzanne, are sharing ideas today. But this one actually came from one of my students. So my student walks in or sits into the Zoom class. And I says, well, you know, I said, well, hi, how are you? And she said, well, she said, I was so bored today. She said, I spent the entire day in my burrito costume. <laughs> I said, you did what? She said, I just sat in my burrito costume. And anyway, I just really laughed. And I said, well, you know what? I said, you've given me an idea. I said, next week is going to be crazy costume week. Like when you come into the Zoom room, I want you to have on your crazy costume. And I'm going to take pictures of everybody. So as I was teaching, fortunately, that crazy little um, thing happened on Monday. So I could tell all my students this week, wear a crazy costume. I have to go find something crazy, <laughs> but it's just, it will just be entertaining, you know, yes. because we have to have fun with these kids. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I just think uh, you've just given us some really, really great, great points. So, um, you know, just sort of in wrapping up, we talked a little bit about the certification course. Is there anything that you would want to leave? I'm, I'm really excited to share information on the Ultimate Music Theory certification course for those that are interested in learning more about it. Um, I do a, um, a masterclass, so you can simply go to teachmusictheory.com and get all the information there. Uh, did you have any so, closing thoughts that you wanted to share with us, Suzanne? Uh, well, I would say um, just have have fun doing this and be like you said, think out of the box, be creative. Uh, don't be compassionate and kind with your parents because this we're all in this together, right? We're all everybody is in this. Everybody's struggling with technology. Yeah. And just give your and then be be kind to yourself too. I just I want to emphasize that that. I mean, I feel a lot of stress right now too because I've 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 got this passion to carry on a legacy that's really important to me. But yet, I need to take care of myself in order to be the best teacher that I can be. Absolutely. So I need to spend time with my husband. I need to give him time. I can't be glued to the screen yes. all the time. Um, so take care of yourself. Treat yourself well. Um, do whatever it is you do for self care, and then then that will make you a better teacher because you're going to have the energy to bring to your teaching and you're going to be providing a good role model, not only, I mean, for yourself and your, your family, but also for your students, because we need to take care of ourselves in order to show up in life. And we so really do. you said that so well, Suzanne, and I'm, and I really want to, you know, to honor you in saying that because we need to have, for me, like I need glory time whether yeah. that's going to go be, you know, sitting in the sauna or if that's going to be just like locking myself in the closet, like just something, but just to rejuvenate. And yeah. what's interesting is that we all rejuvenate differently. Yes, we do. Some of us, we want to watch a movie with, you know, our spouse or go for a walk with our kids or, or, you know, we, um, we want to read a book or we want to go play the piano. Like we have different ways of rejuvenating. We obviously can't go to the spa, but you could give yourself <laughs> a little mani petty. So I think, you know, as long as you take time to do something that just brings you personal joy and fulfillment, right? So that you're, you're ready to serve and we yes. are serving, we are serving our, we kids. Are. and we're not only serving our students anymore, we're ser serving the parents and really getting to know their personalities yes. as well. So it's a, uh, it's an interesting lesson, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much You're for sharing welcome. your insights into how we can get started, you know, teaching online and, and your helpful resources, because it really, as they say, we're all in this together. So uh, I just want to give a little shout out to all of our viewers, whether you're watching the replay, you can just type in the word replay. Uh, remember to join the Ultimate Music Theory Facebook group where you can connect with Suzanne <laughs> and many other music educators and also subscribe to our Ultimate Music Theory YouTube channel. We release new videos every week, and this one will be on there as well. Remember to click the little notification button. I think it's up here somewhere. Uh, so you'll be notified uh, when we release new videos. So take care, and thank you so much again, Suzanne, for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you, Glory. You bet. Take care, everyone. Don't forget Ultimate Music Theory Certification Course Info. Join me on the free masterclass. And I'll just actually pop it up there as we wrap things up. Our... Maybe. Yes. There we go. Okay. You can just pop over to uh, teachmusictheory.com. So teach with passion, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks.